Over a decade in, here are my top simple tips for starting a saltwater fish tank or reef tank. Sorry for the interruption, everybody. Matthew from Hello Reef here. If you're a total newbie, stop what you're doing. Don't watch this video. This is much more of an intermediate level video. Rather, we have Hello Reef Connect, which is included with all of our Hello Reef kits. It's at helloreef.com. It includes 50 beginner videos that walk you through step-by-step -step how to do everything to set up something just like this full of clownfish and anemones. Then when you're done with that, come back, check out this video and all of our videos at our Hello Reef YouTube channel. All right, back to the video. Number one, buy an RODI filter. Now, I've mentioned this a lot in the past, but by buying an RODI filter, not only are you being really kind to your animals, but you are saving a ton of money in the long run. Think about it like this. You can either buy RODI water from your local fish store, you can buy pre-made salt water from your local fish store, or you can go to the grocery store and buy jugs or five gallon containers of filtered water and then mix it at home yourself. But by far the cheapest thing to do is to purchase a $200 RODI filter. It sounds like a high price up front, but you save not only in your first year, but I did a video once and over the course of five years, you save thousands of dollars. So do yourself a favor and buy an RODI filter day one. Number two, you only learn by doing. You can only research so much, let's be honest. I don't know if you were like me, but when I started out, I read and read and read, and I watched tons of videos. I scoured different forums. Bulk Reef Supply had started a few years before. I remember watching New York Stilo. I was crazy inundated with too much information. And at some point, I just had to pull the trigger and start building my tank. Think about it. If you want to learn to be any sort of profession or good at any sort of hobby, let's take piano, for example, you can't just read about how to play the piano you actually have to sit down and play the piano. It's the exact same with saltwater aquariums. You can learn a lot and do your due diligence beforehand, but at the end of the day, it's only that hand-on experience that's gonna make you learn and grow in this hobby. Number three, test twice a week. Now, I don't mean you have to test for every single thing. Sure, I wanna test for ammonia and nitrite at least twice a week when I'm cycling my tank. But once the tank is cycled, I don't really ever test for those things anymore. So then what do I mean test twice a week? I would test for your alkalinity, your nitrate, and your phosphate twice a week. I would do this probably at least for the first six months after starting up a new system. You're going to notice that there are all sorts of swings in your tank, little mistakes you make, coral growth, something dies, and it's going to set things off. And the best thing you can do is catch a swing early so that you can do something like a large water change to get ahead of any problems. Number four, use a PAR meter. Okay, I'm not saying you have to go out and buy a PAR meter because that is an expensive thing for a lot of people. So you really have one of two options. One is to borrow a PAR meter. Your local club probably has one. You might be able to rent one from your local fish store, but knowing the exact output of your lights is crucial and you only have to do this once. We honestly can't tell if something is low PAR or high PAR because our eyes don't see certain wavelengths of blue very well, and blue packs a punch. So you have one of two options. One, you can buy a light and follow instructions that somebody else has done so that you are matching their settings exactly and you'll know their par, or whatever light you get, either purchase, rent, or borrow a par meter, set it up right the first time, and then you can forget about your lights. Number five, start with your end goal. What do you want out of a tank? Now, I have said this for years, going back over a decade of making videos on YouTube, but you need to know what your end goal, because if you want something like this small Hello Reef tank, 15 gallons, that's gonna be something completely different than a 300 gallon behemoth that you wanna put some baby shark into. You need to know your goal so that you can build a tank appropriately. For me, I've built a ton of tanks in my life, and I've tried a whole bunch of different things, but the most satisfying for me at this stage in the hobby is something small, around the 15 gallon size, and knowing that, I can get the appropriate gear to match it. So know your goal first, and then you can go about doing the research you need to succeed. Number six, feed frozen food. Now, I don't mean only feed frozen food, but if you're choosing between frozen food and pellet food, 
do the majority of your feeding with frozen food. It's really high in protein, doesn't have fillers, and won't pollute your tank nearly as much. If you take pellets, they are super nutrient dense, and especially for beginners, really easy to overfeed. But if you use frozen food, something like Hikari mysis shrimp, it is way more difficult to overfeed. So at the end of the day, favor frozen food over pellet food. And then of course you can throw in some pellet food, some algae wafers, stuff like that as the fish or livestock depend on it. Number seven, don't give up. It's really the only way to fail in this hobby. And I mean that. I think I've set up 15 to 20 tanks in the past decade and many of them have completely failed. My first tank was a Red Sea Reefer 170 and it failed because I ran way too much GFO and that was a big thing over a decade ago. My second tank failed because I just got lazy with it and I let it get taken over by nuisance algae and then didn't put in the work to care for it. There are various reasons our tank fails and you have to be gentle with yourself because you're a beginner and you're not gonna get everything right the first time, but when you fail, if you take it as a learning opportunity and then learn and grow and get better at this hobby, fantastic. But if you fail and say, I suck, this is not for me, I can't do this hobby, and you quit, well, that's the only time that you failed. So don't give up and you'll never fail in this hobby. Number eight is gonna be a little controversial. Do a weekly 20% water change. Now I know there are people out there who are intermediate advanced hobbyists who don't do water changes, but let me tell you, that is not for beginners for a whole host of reasons. I've also said in the past that doing a 10% weekly water change is great, and absolutely a 10% weekly water change is great. Now I don't remember the math on this, but if you do a 10% weekly water change, you are limiting how much nitrate, phosphate, and other things can possibly add up in your tank. But if you do a 20% weekly water change, especially if you have something small like this 15 gallon system, that's only three gallons a week, really easy to accomplish, and you are gonna have so much more success. I've actually gone further than 20% a week, and on this tank here, I do five gallons a week, which is probably somewhere around 40%. I do this because I've been overfeeding a little bit and my nitrates and phosphates have been creeping up. So rather than deal with things like GFO or carbon dosing, just do a larger water change once a week. It's not that expensive. Your animals are gonna love it and it's gonna stop a lot of problems from even starting. Tip number nine, get two heaters and an aquarium controller. Now, I don't mean you have to go out and get some sort of fancy aquarium controller. I'm talking about a temperature controller, either something from Inkbird or Bayite. These can range anywhere from $30 to $60, give or take. Now, why two heaters? Well, you're gonna have one that is plugged into your temperature controller. That's gonna be your primary heater that keeps your tank from 77 to 78 degrees. But at some point, that heater will die. It might be five years, might be 10 years, might be two years, I don't know. I've had good luck with heaters and mine have gone for many, many years, well over five years. But when that heater dies, you want that second heater to kick on before the tank gets too cold. So that first heater you plug into the temperature controller, keeps your tank 77 to 78 degrees. When that heater eventually dies, you've had a second heater sitting in there set to 74 or 75 degrees that will automatically kick on and save your tank. And you'll know when that happens because your temperature controller has an alarm on it. So you can set it to go off at 75 or 76 degrees, knowing that your primary heater is broken and it's time to take your secondary heater move it to the primary position and buy a second, third secondary heater. Number 10 comes from my friend Thomas over at BRS TV. Stick to the basics and learn as you go. Here's what he means. Don't go out and buy every piece of gear you might need someday. It's really easy to do something like over filter your tank. If you have multiple filter socks, a, a fleece roller, a macroalgae refugium, an oversized protein skimmer, an algae scrumber, ozone reactor, a UV sterilizer, if you have all of these things and you put them in your tank day one, you're gonna overclean the water and that's gonna spell disaster for corals, right? Your fish are gonna be fine with that, but your corals are absolutely not. 
Rather, start simple. You don't need anything fancy. Start with a simple tank like this one that only has for filtration a sponge and a filter sock. Then, as you grow in this hobby, as your tank matures, as you water test, and you find the areas where your tank is lacking, then you can add in filtration as needed. Maybe it'll be a time for a protein skimmer, or maybe the best bet is gonna be adding some sort of copepod refugium. You'll figure that out as you go along, just don't add it all at the beginning. So stick to the basics, don't overdo it at the beginning, and only tackle problems as your tank matures. Number 11, buy DC pumps. DC pumps cost more than AC pumps, and typically in most tanks you're gonna have return pumps and wave makers. You might have some other pumps in there as well, but those are the primary ones and the ones that are gonna be on all the time. When you're new to the hobby, the buzzing from AC pumps may not bother you, but as soon as you switch to a DC pump and it runs completely silently, it's gonna blow your mind because it's just so much nicer. Not only are DC pumps virtually silent, like listen, if there was an AC pump going right now, I would hear a hmm, but there's not. All I hear is a small trickle of water. So not only are DC pumps silent, but they're also controllable. And having a controllable pump is super handy for adjusting the flow to getting it just where you want it or for creating randomness in your aquarium, which is great for your anemones and coral. Tip number 12 is a mixture from two of my colleagues, Josh and Kyle. Pick one source of information and stick with it, and especially from Josh, be sure the source you choose shows both their successes and their failures. Nobody is perfect in this hobby, and if somebody tries to convince you that they are, it's probably good to stay away from them because they're either miraculous or they're not being completely honest with you. The problem with consuming too much information is imagine making chocolate chip cookies. You could find 10 different recipes and then combine those 10 recipes together and you're gonna get a really crappy chocolate chip cookie because while there are many ways to make a chocolate chip cookie, you can't put them all together, they're all distinct. It's very similar to that in this hobby. There are many, many ways to build and maintain a successful saltwater aquarium. Just don't go mixing and matching and putting them together because it's probably not gonna work. Rather, find a good source of information, whether that's me, whether that's Bulk Reef Supply, whether that's someone on a forum, stick with it. And then once you get your feet wet in this hobby, then you can put out your feelers to other sources to help advise you and grow your knowledge in this hobby. Ugh, I'm talking too long. Okay, number 13, check the list here. Tip number 13, use a screen or a lid. Now, they're slightly different. Typically, when we're talking about a screen, we're talking about some sort of mesh. It allows for good air and gas exchange between the surface and the air, but it's also going to evaporate quite a bit of water from your tank. Where if you use a glass lid, on the other hand, it does cut down on the gas exchange, increases the heat inside your tank, but it cuts down on evaporation a lot. But using a screen or a lid is just good practice to protect your fish. There are a ton of fish that are known jumpers, gobies, rasses, name a couple, but there are other fish that aren't known jumpers that will sometimes jump if they're scared. For example, I've had clownfish in tanks for years that never jumped out of my tank, which of course didn't have a mesh screen or a lid on it, and then one day, one did, and I found it dead, and I was horrified by that. So do yourself a favor, get a lid, a mesh screen, build one for yourself, have someone make it for you so that it looks nice, cuts down on evaporation a little bit, and also makes your fish safe. Tip number 14, get what you want the first time. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, if you know and you have your heart set on a 120 gallon mixed reef system, but it's just out of your price range right now, rather than buying something smaller, save up for it and get what you want the first time. Now, that's not universally good advice, okay? If you know it's gonna take you years to, to, to get there and you have a good deal on something small, yeah, absolutely go ahead and get that smaller system because there's a lot to learn and a lot of joy to be taken from a smaller system. But if you know there's only one reason you wanna get into this hobby, one type of pet or animal that you absolutely have to have, then just be a little patient, save up your money, and get the gear you need the first time. 
Number 15, use a UV sterilizer. Now, I don't know if this one's controversial or not. Some people will say it's completely unnecessary, and it may be unnecessary, but I just know this. When I've used a UV sterilizer on a system, I've had way more success than when I have it. Now, maybe it was just random chance, but there are some really good UV sterilizers out there in an eight watt or a 15 watt size that don't need fancy plumbing. Yeah, I have some bigger UV sterilizers that can be plumbed into your system, but there are some really cool ones from Aqua UV that are hang on the back UV sterilizers. Literally, you hang it on the side, you add a pump, and you are now UV sterilizing your small tank. So again, I don't know if it's just chance, but I would recommend getting a UV sterilizer. It will help cut down on all sorts of bad things in your tank, help your fish thrive, and maybe avoid some of the nasties like dinoflagellates. Number 16, use Velcro cable ties. I learned this the hard way. Wire management, of course, is absolutely crucial. You'll be shocked and dismayed with how many different cables it takes to run a small system. So in the past, I had used normal cable ties to keep my wires secured, cinched together, but then you have to do one thing. Maybe you have to change a heater out. Maybe you need to clean a pump. And the only way to do that is to pull it off of your system and take it to the sink. But then you have to go through and cut all those cable ties. And not only that, but I have damaged myself. I've had deep gouges in my skin from cable ties that I hadn't cut perfectly. Velcro cable ties are the answer. I use them in all of my system. I buy huge packs of them. I use them all around the house using Velcro cable ties. Not only will save your arms from getting cut, but it will allow you to make changes and do maintenance on your gear easily and whenever you need it. Tip number 17. I actually don't have any more. Check out another Hello Reef video here and I'll see you in the next episode. Be well and happy reefing everybody.